Hello, I am speaking with Dr. Jan Niesen, who is a professor at the Department of Geography at the University of Ghent in Belgium. He teaches courses on geomorphology, hydrology, physical environment, and development. His research, uh, which has a main concentration in Ethiopia, focuses on the identification and quantification of changes in the coupled system of humans' environment, with a focus on natural phenomena of slope processes, hydrogeomorphology, and land degradation. His publications include Geotrekking in Ethiopia's Tropical Mountains, the Duoga Tembian District, and articles about the anthropology, geography, and sociology of the Tigray region in Ethiopia. I am pleased to have Dr. Neeson on the channel. Welcome. Thank you. Hello. I want to start with a recently released investigation article published by Reuters regarding the massacres which occurred in Maikadra on November 9th, shortly after the conflict in Tigray began. Initial eyewitness testimony came with conflicting narratives between the perpetrators and victims between Amhara and Tigrayan residents who reside in the town and the Ethiopian government did not give much clarity after Amnesty International released its initial report, which indicated that TPLF backed militia forces carried out the atrocities. Since then, a new breakthrough in the inquiry has found that the killings were more inter-ethnic and widespread Based on your findings and understanding of what has been happening since November, what do we know for sure happened on that day? Uh, and what do we know um, has transpired since then? There have been there have been different narratives and they have been built up based on interviews with with people. Uh, there has been, especially from the side of the Ethiopian government, a strong narrative that has been released immediately that 700 villagers, Amhara villagers, had been killed, daily laborers and, and so on. That has been supported then almost by the Ethiopian Human Rights uh, Commission. And that was a narrative that was sent out to the world and sent out also, especially inside Ethiopia mentioning it as an incident and seeking revenge for that uh, for that incident this is a classic this is a classic approach when a war starts you need to find something very strong to to attract the public opinion to you now what has happened is that there is, has been inter ethnic killings but these amhara people who have been killed uh, their id numbers are known but their names have never been released so there is something with that there is, there is an, uh, how should I say, uh, when, the, when the war started, the technique of the Amhara, not militias of the FANU, was the human wave technique. They have been, they have been brainstorming their people, saying that uh, even if one million of us get killed, uh, and if we win over Tigray, it is, it is good. And they have sent people really by budget to, to fight against the Tigrayans. So a lot of these militias have been in these human waves have been have been killed uh, also. And I think it needs really a forensic investigation. Are these really people who were living in my cadre? Or are these a Fano militia who are also farmers in, in simple civilian clothes who have been who have been killed? Then revenge has come. Tigrayans have been killed also. So I think in this, in this uh, case, continuing on narratives, I think it will not, you will never find the truth. It needs really to excavate and to do a forensic uh, investigation. But the main thing is that this has been used as a justification for all the atrocities that have, that have come. My cadre, my cadre, my cadre. And if you talk about Aksum, my cadre. But for every of their massacres, they will talk about my cadre. You know when there was the when there was the war of Italy against Ethiopia in 1935, totally at the beginning, there was an incident. Was called Gondrand incident. You can search it on Wikipedia. Gondrand incident, and there, uh, 35 Italian civilians, uh, road workers, had been killed. This has been used by Mussolini during the whole war in Italy to win the support from the public opinion. I think this is the main, a similar in uh, uh, Abiy Ahmed has used 
by Kadra in a similar way to win the public, public opinion to his, uh, to his side. During the actual day that the event occurred, which um, was not only a terrible uh, uh, tragic event of ethnic killing, the report that was released uh, came from Amnesty International. Why has um, the Ethiopian government disputed the organization which released the report and the findings? I'm, I'm, you, are, you are taking me a bit away from, okay. you know, I have been, I have been twice to Western, to Western, no, a bit, a bit more, but to that place so close to the Sudan border. I have been there twice during all the years that I was, that I was in Tigray. I know only what media are, what media are reporting about, about this. I try to find my way in that, but I cannot give you reasons why Amnesty International says the same or different things as the, as the Ethiopian government. Uh, your team, according to Reuters, identified more than 8,000 civilians killed mm -hmm. and identified approximately 2,500 of these um, since the conflict began. To what extent, from your research, have each of the combatants contributed to the killings or if you know the identities of the victims? Yeah, we know, we can say, we can say that, that there is, there are two cases where the name of Tigray fighters or TPLF or, or something is mentioned. And one case is, uh, is the one in Maikadra. The second one is around the Hitsats refugee camp where there have, have been very strong, you can say, tensions between the local Tigrayans and the Eritrean refugees that were in the camps. Even inside these camps, some uh, there, were, there were frictions between different sorts of, uh, of Eritreans. And, and, and when this lawlessness of the war came, it is possible also that around this Hitsats camp, Tigrayans have killed Eritreans. Right? It's possible. But then we have all the other massacres. And all the other massacres that is top is, is the Eritrean, are the Eritrean soldiers. It is, it's something that is, in the beginning, it was very disturbing for the people in Tigray. When the telephone came back, they were so, they were so, they were so shocked. And beginning they would say these are the these are the Eritrean lowlanders and they take revenge on the highlanders uh, but then also Eritrean highlanders were doing such uh, such crimes also and that is about 50 percent of the people who are massacred we have published that because what right Reuters is citing is published so the statistics are in there and almost 50 percent of the people killed were killed by Eritrean uh, by Eritrean troops. It must have to do with their type of military training and with, with making the people a bit brainless. I don't know how what, what happens in that in that sour camp. So how can they do uh, people are so surprised how can they cut how can they cut an arm of somebody before killing them? Yeah, this type of this type of things. Yeah. From the same article, the it mentioned that the Amhara region is seeking to formally annex parts of the disputed territory between the border mm. region, especially in the West, which equates to about a quarter of the size of Tigray, yeah. including that particular key between Ethiopia and Sudan, that Al Fashaga uh, border area. Yeah. The, the Amhara regional government says that it's taken control of Western Tigray and its representatives plan to resettle up to half a million Amharas there. What's the history of the disputed territory and why is it important to understand it in this context? Um, we, have, we have to see, first of all, that this is a lowland area, a relatively lowland going down to an altitude of 500 meters, totally different environment than in the Amhara region, totally different environment than in most of, uh, of uh, Tigray. This used to be bushland for a very long time very long time. These bushes were growing very well because this, in many places the soil is very fertile. It is very sold, the so-called black cotton soil. Um, but as long as, let us say, until the, until the 1960s, 1950s, 1960s, nobody was interested in there. And you yeah, were having some remote people who are, or people who were living in those remote places. If we take, you know that if you go back 200, 300 years, all these provinces like Godjam and Shoah and so on, that was not existing. Yeah, that's creation starting from Menelik. 
Uh, at that time, they made provinces, which are, you, you get that old map, they have all are having their capital in fisheye position, quite close to Addis Ababa, and then it extends a very long stretch into the lowlands, regardless, regardless of ethnicity. If you take, for example, Gotsam, it was having Amhara, it was having Tigrayans, it was having uh, Gumus, it was having Ago. So it, it made up one province, which was on the moment that they decided to group the country based on, on or to organize the country based on ethnicity, then the borders of Tigray were drawn according to more or less, and with lots of conflicts, but more or less according to language borders. And we forget about these old these old uh, provinces. We have we have maps from books that have, have nothing to do uh, agronomy books, and they put. I have a book, 1973, Agricultural Systems of Ethiopia. Nothing to do with languages, but there is a language map in there. They will show that part of Western Tigray as part of uh, as part of Gondar, but also language spoken Tigrinya. So you are having you are having an ancient population there, which is basically speaking Tigrinya with at very low population density, living in that bushland. Then the war of the 1970s, 1980s came. Um, this area became also a stronghold of the TPLF. TPLF was building its route to Sudan through which the refugees went through that, through that area. Um, when then TPLF won, defeated, defeated Derg, the country was redrawn, redrawn according to ethnic lines, and that became part of, of Tigray. Uh, Tigray has then used that for resettling part of the population. That has been my view. It is a, it is a wrong tendency all over Ethiopia. They try to resettle highlanders to the lowlands, saying the highlands are over, overpopulated. We need to resettle the people to the lowlands. Pushing people to totally to another to, an, to another uh, area. It's an odd way for resolving. Normally, you should try in those highly productive highlands. You should try to improve your economy, so that you can have a higher population density. But they have pushed. So people, the clients have been over the last thirty years have been settling to those areas using that common, using that common language. Yeah, that's a bit what has. Uh, uh, that's a bit what has happened. De facto, de facto, the closer you come to, for example, if you take a town like uh, like uh, Mait Sebri, uh, the closer you come to Amhara region, the more you will hear Amhara spoken. But that's the same like in Koran. Yeah, or it's the same like in Alamata. You will hear Amharic spoken on the main road in the business. If you go, not if you go to villages outside, it's purely Tigrinya. Yeah? If you go even the street behind the main street, it's speaking Tigrinya. But you are having some towns that were having mixed population with Amharic and, and Tigrayans. The point is that they have been, how should I say, stirring it up. Yeah, you could, you, I, I, am, I am living here in, in Belgium. Uh, I'm living here in Belgium. I, I'm studying in a, I'm working in Flemish speaking university. I live in the French speaking part. I switch from one language to the other. and. Nobody is complaining about that, and everybody is most most of the time. When it is elections, they will stir it up. Also, these ethnic things, also in Belgium, not to the extent in Ethiopia, but they have, they have, you know, when you when you speak about even if you speak if it is about TPLF and you say daytime hyenas, yeah, and if this you speak about uh, uh, it, it trickles down on the Tigrayan population. So there has been there has been this otherness that has been created. Tigrayans are others and they need to be punished for everything they have been done over 30 years. Uh, that was something that has been built up in this, in the months or the years preceding that war. So it seems that from your explanation of the contemporary history that uh, Tigrayans, but also generally people who live in the northern part of the country are creating ethnic enclaves and they're trying to settle their population with respect to natural resource, um, uh, natural resources that exist where they live. How much has that influenced the fighting that we're seeing today? It's a bit, it's a bit everywhere right, that you are having this, 
this conflicts between regions, between Somalia and Oromo, you were having big fighting and so on. It has not taken the proportions in other places like it was having in, uh, uh, in Tigray. Now they are with a, uh, there is, even Abiy Ahmed is at the moment is not giving in to his Amhara allies. His Amhara allies, they claim this is Western Amhara and de facto they put signposts. This is Northern Amara, they put signposts, Northern Gondar and so on, but this has not been recognized by an Ethiopian parliament. Every other nationality will be afraid. Because if they take some part of Tigray and give it to Amara, what, what about Bini Shangul Gumus? What about Oromo? What about Afar? There will be claims from Amara to all those areas also. Huh? Now, Western Tigray is big. They have a problem because they, due to, fight, due to fighting against, uh, against Tigray, they had to take out their soldiers from that Al Fashaga area. So Sudan took the opportunity to, to move to move in. So they want to resettle people there, but I don't know how it can how and if it can work, of course. You uh recently released one of your books or uh, a short mini uh, documentary uh, regarding the efforts to plant trees in Tigray or mm -hmm. or forestation. How has yeah. that work uh, developed since uh, the war began? Or could you briefly summarize um, how yeah, that well, we, What we did, what we did was to find, I can almost say every historical landscape photo, we are having more than 500, starting from 1868. And we tried to relocate, we were having more than 500, but we could relocate 500. That means standing at the same place as the original photographer. We made again a photo. If it was black and white, we published in black and white. If it was color, we published in color. And then we asked experts to compare, to compare the photos and to see how has the vegetation changed. And in 90% of the cases, the vegetation has increased between historical time and let me say period after 2010. And that was when we started that. that uh, so there has been a general increase in vegetation. Even it was funny, in some mountain areas, the farmers told me, at the time of my grandfather, everything was forest. Then we had the photo and we showed him, look, this is at the time of your grandfather. It was barren, even more barren than nowadays. So people were having that idea, that memory, everything was green, but that's, that's so long ago. Huh? That's not the time of their grandfather. So that is what the change that has come up to. Up to now, people talk now about destruction of environment. I would say, as far as we can see, that in such a short time, you cannot destroy everything that has been done over 30 years. We see, we see photos, we see photos that are deliberate cutting of trees that is there, definitely. Burning, you know, burning of grassland, bushland, but it will regrow. That's, I'm not very much afraid for, for that. So I see deliberate actions to destroy the environment of Tigray. Right? But when we look to satellite imagery, we don't see an overall deforestation now in this short time. It is really impossible. Uh, now, locally damage is there. We don't know how long it will take. I would like very much to be in Tigray again eh, with my camera and go back to those places again. And that would be a very useful to compare the situation before the war and, and after the war. What we will see is damage along the roads. Yeah, what we will see is damage nearby the towns. For example, the fact uh, the fact that there are so many power cuts in Mekele makes that people have shifted back to charcoal, something that they had forgotten since 10 years. The charcoal must come from somewhere. So the charcoal is because has become very expensive. So people who are doing business, bringing charcoal with their donkey at the risk of their life, the people who are bringing charcoal to, to Mekele, they can make money with it. So that's a reason for, in the surroundings of Mekele, deforestation to take so that uh, most recent example you just gave about supplying power, it's sort of a result of what has happened because of the efforts in the war to uh, starve the population, not just mm. with food resources, but also other utilities needed for survival. Yes, that's obvious. Huh? Um, this, can, can, you imagine, hmm. can you imagine this? I don't remember how many hundred or 300,000. They call them IDPs. I don't know. I don't like the term because it is a bit. It is a bit. There is no feeling in it. Huh? They are internal refugees. Yeah, they have been people who are chased out from their place. 
they are all sitting in in Syria. They all need to cook. What will they do? They will go to any bushland and, and cut trees and cut branches and and, and use that for, for surviving. You can blame them. How much of the water resources or other uh, utilities have been affected uh, since the conflict began, to your knowledge? No, I, well, I know there are data about, but these data are about uh, about offices. Right? The water, every town has a small office that that's, that manages the water distribution in the in the town. Uh, so that that has been destroyed. Motor pumps have been destroyed. I don't know percentages of that, but we are always talking about areas along the roads, uh, areas that can be easily reached for being uh, for being dis destroyed. The situation in Mekele was already and that's the worst of the whole of Tigray yeah, when it comes to water, and that situation was already very bad before the war was there. They were having a big lake here of Sigan, and for some reason they were not able to pump that water efficiently to. You may know that some years before the war, there was strong discontent in the whole of Tigray against the TPLF party. And one of the reasons was that poor, was that poor, uh, that poor water supply in, in Mekele. And people in Mekele tell, tell me, now it is the same like before. If we, want, if we need water, there are private tanker lorries that are driving up and down and we buy from them. Yeah, the public water, the tap is not, the tap is not running. Yeah? So for the... Uh, rural places people are used to go to to the spring and so, but I think um, major change and change in negative sense is in all these small towns. For example, the town where I'm where I'm used to live, that is Hagar Salem. It is a bit difficult because it's high up in the mountains, so you need always to be able to pump. There is no fuel, so people need to go down with donkeys very deep in the valleys to find the spring and to fetch uh, and to fetch water. The history of the regional administration of different ethnic parties, uh, sometimes it makes it harder uh, to conduct geographical or population surveys of an area in, of interest because of the lack of uh, a census being taken or other common identifiers that the government uses to get an understanding for the characteristics in the region. How has your work helped solve this challenge? We were we were not, uh, and now you are talking about war situation or pre-war situation. But just in general. But it's very different, 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 different yeah. of course, in the pre-war situation. But one or research has never, not in the pre-war and not now, has never regarded into ethnicity and all these things. Except when recording the names of the, the victims of the name of the names of the perpetrators. But otherwise, if, for example, we know we know one massacre, and it, it, it's a bit uh, in Mahabradego. It came it came in the media. In that massacre in Mahabradego, several of the victims they are Amhara. They are Amhara people who had settled who had settled in that village and they have been killed just like the others. We simply record them as as uh, victims. So they have been killed by the by the uh, Ethiopian army. What what in current situation, what makes it difficult is that population data, when we need to talk about population densities and so on, number of displaced persons versus population density, that is that the population densities are not very reliable. The last census, census was in 2007. Yeah? We have to trust that that was well done. Uh, and then for all subsequent they added 3% per year, yeah? estimated growth rate. But there was lots of internal migration. If you go, for example, especially Western Tigray, this has grown much faster than 3% because continuously people were finding work there, were moving there you, legally or even yeah, and getting their ID there or even illegally and moving there and, settl and settling there. So that, that population was much bigger than the data that were originally uh, that were provided in the statistics of the uh, central statistical agency. So that is, that's a bit difficult. What we see when we look to that area now from satellite imagery is that it is largely empty. Now people have analyzed that. You can see that all the homesteads in many villages, all the homesteads that are burned down, 
when we look to the status of plowing, that's the worst, because we can see that from satellite imagery, that is the worst in Western Tigray, simply because the people have been pushed out. We see even croplands still now, where the crop from the previous year is still standing. It has never been harvested and not, not plowed because the people have, have moved, have moved uh, out. Maybe one thing that I still wanted to say, that is what I spent talking, working with official data and so on. We were having the, fer the, the, the specific case of the fertilizer, where big statistics were aired about such fertilizer consumption. And then we find out, found out that the farmers were forced to buy that fertilizer and then they sold it, they resold it on the black market. But the, region, the bosses could be proud, look, we have sold so many fertilizer. And then the farmers, they, they resold it to some, to some uh, uh, agro-industrial uh, companies. So we, had to, we have to be very careful with all official data because there, there is a history of manipulation. Is there is there a way in which we can corroborate the information that comes from the region in addition to what you've been doing? Have you been working with other researchers or other um, partners in this respect? Yeah. Uh, well, yes, sir. So, and I will give you details. Yes, but first, what I want to say is, in the beginning, we were almost the only ones to claim. I'm, I'm now talking early December that Eritrean soldiers were there and that they were doing very bad things. Yeah? And when people were telling that, Ethiopian government was immediately saying, these are all, these are all lies, there is nothing. He, Abi was even saying to Gutierrez, I can assure you that no Eritreans are involved. So he's bluntly lying in his, uh, in his face. And we were coming out with, with that information. We were coming out with information about, about the massacre in Aksum. And then later on, when people investigate that they found, yes, it is true. Yeah? So what we do is we don't take it at face value when one person says one thing. I have always, I always think people may have an interest to come with, with manipulated story. So when we get that information, we try to approach somebody that we know in the same Warada or in a nearby Warada. Did you hear about the massacre and in that place? And do you know names? And they will tell you some names that fits partially with our list, but it tends to prove uh, what has happened. We had, we had only to reject one list of uh, victims that came to us. That list was even having the stamp of the regional government of the interim administration of Tigray. So they managed to get a stamp on that to prove their list. Once, once we contacted that village, we found out that uh, many of these people, they died already before three or before four years. Some died in Saudi Arabia. They will not fabricate a list with people who are alive. Yeah, because that would be very shocking for all the relatives if, if it was broadcasted that this person is killed. But the names, some names were there of people who were killed earlier on. Now, I can understand the people. They're starving from hunger. They want attention to their village. They come with such a list. But we have to be careful. Eh? And, so there is one list like that that we spotted, and then we didn't include, of course. But otherwise, our triangulation, look also that the interim government of Tigray, uh, they have to use maybe not the big boss, Abraham, but uh, if you go to one level, one level below, and they are saying the same thing. The Eritreans are preventing from plowing. Yeah, they, they say it very clearly. What we get from our key informants on the ground, they say it. They say it officially. You know, when I think of the stifling of the population, part of the uh, problem that I think most people have uh, yet to understand is the magnitude in which this uh, starvation crisis has occurred throughout the, the, the region. Is it densely populated within one part of Tigray? Is it more widespread? Is it a chronic um, inflation of the population being starved? Uh, what is the exact um, phenomena occurring? Yeah, what we, the, the, we have the data from the famine early warning system, yeah, where they spot, especially on central Tigray and on eastern Tigray as the places that are most affected by uh, 
by family five five up to ten percent of the uh, of the population uh, this is something that grows you know it it makes a curve like that huh? it starts slow it's it starts slowly and then it will increase strongly and we are at that stage when it is still increasing increasing slowly but if there is no action now it will it will go up very uh, very rapidly we were having of course these individual cases of people starving that's already almost from the beginning of the war if you are unlucky and you are in a bad place where everything has been destroyed and they don't allow you to move and yeah you can you can or and people i i know one of my one of our uh, of our staff when the war started he ran they went to the mountains for hiding the man got sick he was old cold and sick in the mountain he came down to his village hospital was totally destroyed he couldn't go to the hospital and he died in his village he has not been formally killed by ethiopian or eritrean soldiers yeah but he is dead as a result of the uh, of the war and this is going to happen more and more because people become weaker and weaker and some people will not will not resist we've also heard reports that uh, white phosphorus has been used in Tigray as a means to uh, stifle the population. This uh, chemical weapons um, mm -hmm. narrative has been circulating in the media in the past month, especially in the southern area near Samre and Gidget. Do we know anything about that? Um, I cannot tell you more than what has been in the media because what people on the ground tell me is the same story. So either they get it from the international media or TMH is rebroadcasting it and it, it enters into their into their story, which is which is normally, but I don't have any direct uh, witness uh, myself of that. What I know about about uh, Samri area for sure, that is that there has been used of cluster bombs. Cluster bomb is a bomb that uh, cluster bomb is a bomb that falls. And while it is falling, it opens, and 100 small bombs of two kilo, they drop, they spread to all directions. So you have like a bombing all over the over the area. So that has been used. That has been used in summary area from the white phosphorus. We know some images of people have been burned over their whole body. There are reports coming out today mentioning that 40 tons have arrived in Mekelik a couple of days uh, of days ago. Uh, so they may be trying to use it uh, to use it again, but I don't have any direct evidence, and we didn't investigate more than other journalists, the than journalists have done. Going back to what you said about the importance or the significance of the roads in Tigray being sort of a structure for how the war has been playing out. Yes. This, the population is centered around the city structure, but also they're spread out in the rural, rural areas. Yeah. Uh, to what effect has this played in the targeting of civilians or how has the work been in trying to study civilian, civilian casualties uh, affected the process of understanding that work? Yeah, well, uh, living a lot nearby a road in peacetime, it is something that is good because you can move very easily. You can trade your, you can trade your, your, your wear quite easily. Uh, so people have been coming to the have been coming to the roads. A lot of small villages and road towns have popped uh, have popped up, and those have been the places that were then directly targeted when the war came. Um, maybe one of the reasons for the Tigray special forces in November December to be running from one defeat to another, in fact, and retreating very rapidly, were all these roads. Could be used very easily by invading forces to, to, to come to San. So, and then what they have done is to settle along the roads. And when they settled along the roads, they forbid the people to move out of their village. So they settle in a village. I know it from some villages that I know. They take half of the houses of the village. That's where their soldiers will stay. The people have to stay with their relatives or in the other houses of the village. And they are not allowed to leave their village because they want to use them as a, as a human shield huh, in case of uh, gradually these people are moving 
And now there are lots of ghost towns along the roads where people have simply moved out because it is way too risky. Especially then, especially then the young men, they are, they are moving away. Either they go to the mountains to join the TTF or they go to Michele or to, to, to hide with, with relatives or uh, to, to be out of the out of that of the, those places. Then there has been, once they occupied all this road network, they have quite pushed, they have quite pushed towards the villages, towards the mountains, because Tigray was full of rural access roads, which have been built mainly by human labor to make their village accessible. And now this is used by armies to come and and attack them. And there have been many killings even in remote in remote villages. What I hear now from people is saying Ethiopian and Eritrean army don't have the force anymore to come to those remote villages. They will stay nearby the road. And there is some hope, but for them, they are not really interested in having remote mountain areas and so on. What they need is the big towns and the roads. Huh? And, and they have like a kind of like a kind of uh, strategy where the, the warning is to the Tigray forces, don't attack us, otherwise we take revenge on the villagers. Right? So that's a way of, that's their way of sustaining their army along the roads uh, and in the towns. Has the Ethiopian government um, been able to uh, allow you access to work in the region? Have you given any um, uh, admission of wanting to work in Tigray during this uh, war? Have you been able to send feelers in the region um, to survey For the area? myself going there? Not, maybe not you, but just someone, one of your associates who may have a better access or a better way of traveling. Yeah, but if they have gone, I will not tell you. Because, okay, <laughs> I respect yeah, that. That's one, but we have been working there since 25 years. Okay. Uh, and we know a lot of people on the ground. Now, let me ask you this. How has the experience been working in Tigray or working with them, with your associates? Just uh, before generally. The, before yeah, the war, before the war. Was, if, if I'm going there since, what is it now, 94, right? that's 27 years. So that means that we could work together very nicely. We do, could do a lot of, we could do a lot of research. Uh, what is also very interesting is that Mostly the people that we were working with at McKinley University, they were very interested in that in that research. The farmers also were very interested. We saw also that many of our findings were used in my field as then soil and water conservation and, and such things. Huh? Uh, many of our findings were, were used for improving the livelihood of the of the people, and we feel we feel confident to, to work there. And that's how I could continue going back. Uh, going back there. Now, uh, you may know that I have also received extreme threats, death threats and so on. So that seems already not wise for me, even if they would give me a visa. Not wise, you know, when you are... When I, I had, there was a program of one hour and a half on Amhara television simply insulting me. Yeah, because of the... Because of the... We did an appeal for ceasefire and for humanitarian aid, and that was without speaking even the talk that I'm speaking with you here, but um, uh, that was enough to, 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 to throw a lot of insults and uh, death threats uh, and death threats on us. So I don't think it will be wise to go to go at, at this stage. And in any way, what could you would from, from doing a real research? Well, but, you know, look, look at journalists who are going there. Yeah, if it is to, to, to move like journalists with, an, with half an army of fixers and drivers and so on, I've never been used to working that way. My way of working there was to walk all alone to the villages, maybe one person with me to, to assist. But this type of investigation, I think that's better for, for journalists to do it at this, at this stage than for, my, uh, than for myself to go, uh, to go there. How much of these reports do you use to confirm or deny the investigation that you uh, used to um, survey the region? Because recently CNN re uh, released a uh, short uh, segment with uh, a correspondent who witnessed the Eritrean and Ethiopian armies blocking the roads for allowing the humanitarian aid yeah. to go in. 
we, we have for block, there are two, there are two types of data that we know that exist, but we did not yet have them. One is the blocking of the roads. Uh, the other is the presence of these ghost villages along the roads. Yeah, we know that there are many, but we, we cannot have exact, exact data. When we start talking to our friends in, in the right, they will say it is everywhere. Yeah, so that's a bit the, uh, but you have seen, you have seen that roadblocks when Mark Lowcock a few days ago was giving his presentation about the, about the famine in Tigray, where he announced the 350,000 people who are at risk of famine right now. There he mentioned the, the roadblocks, for, for, I think in one month, 155 roadblocks. Yeah, that eight workers were stopped. Huh? We are not speaking about the normal traffic, but simply eight workers were stopped 155 times. Out of the 155 times, they were stopped once by Tigrayan forces. And all the rest, they were stopped, prevented by Ethiopian, Eritrean, or uh, Amara forces. But I'm simply repeating what Mark Loco said in this case. How much of a role has humanitarian aid relief and NGOs had on the verification of the figures that you're receiving? And are there testimony and accurate reflection, in your view, about the fighting that's been taking place? These are two. These are two different different questions. I think. Um, the big issue with these data that we are having about aid distribution is that some at some level this comes from somebody who is recording it. You cannot know this from talking to a farmer. How much tons have come to it? They, they will not know it. Uh, they simply come to take their share and they move away as fast as they can. Right? So they, they, but people in the aid sector, people in the regional government uh, sector, they are keeping those statistics. Basically, these are statistics about lorries leaving. So many tons have been sent to this Florida. They can be diverted. Yeah? The last mile, uh, that's the big problem. They can be diverted. You know, a very common <clears throat> trick, a very common trick that these uh, much of the aid is distributed by PP, that is the Prosper Prosperity Party officials with soldiers and then drivers to, to drive it. Uh, a very common uh, practice is that the standard is 15 kilo of grain yeah, to give to one family. Uh, they make them sign 15 kilo and they give them seven. They give them eight kilo. I don't know. I need 15 kilo. Or you will get nothing. Either you sign and you take seven kilo, or you don't sign and you take nothing. Yeah, then what can you do? You sign for 15. The other seven, eight kilo, it, they take it to Eritrea or they sell it for the for, for themselves. They sell it to floor factory and uh, uh, and so on. And so the issue is rather a big discrepancy between data that are recorded, and we have seen sell sheets and so on and we have compiled to the best of our knowledge but if you you would make the sum of what is really received by all the individuals you don't reach you may reach even less than half of what is officially uh, distributed so essentially we're working on estimates based on what you can gather from the population or are you using the population in this particular area no, no, as the, a the population is there as, as a qualitative okay for helping the, the quantitative data are coming from are coming from people at different stages at different levels who are involved in that uh, in that uh, distribution. The quantitative information is nothing has this exists also. Eh? Nothing has never come to our world. Yeah, if you take those more remote places like Adet and so on, nothing has ever come. Yeah, and then. Uh, uh, that's that's also an information, of course. Uh, and other things in our place, they have took the war is there since six months. They have we, we received once fifteen kilo, yeah, one time. Eh? So what, right. yeah, that's small. According to a notes meeting uh, released by the UN agencies on last Monday, the IPC analysis they released stated that famine conditions could be worse, as they did not include. Uh, figures from Amhara controlled areas in Western Tigray. Uh, what sources can we expect to see confirm these figures in that part of the region? 
very difficult to know what is very difficult to know what is ongoing there. Huh? They have they seem to have secured very well the area along the Amhara region. That means uh, along the main roads. But what is happening in the in the more in the interior between that? Let me say between Dancha and the Kese River, or between Dancha and uh, uh, Maitsebri. Uh, we don't know if there, there are still people who are there. Huh? Uh, but I don't know what can be their their uh, their food uh, their food status. From your understanding of the region, where is it most difficult to access uh, the population? It's Tigray. For those who may not be familiar, uh, is a very mountainous area, and sometimes it's hard to travel through the very rocky courses that exist because of. Just if you're surveying the topography, it's hard mm -hmm. for these vehicles to move without paved yeah. roads and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, now, people, if people trust, that's why all these NGOs are traveling with big flags on their cars. But nowadays, every car, even university cars, they will have big flags with logo on their on their on, on their car. But when people see vehicles come, they will come. To a, to a place that is more or less accessible, if they think that they can trust it. Yeah. We see especially MSF, they are providing medical care. They go, they take, I view they take big risks, they try to pass the roadblocks, they go to the areas that are also under control of the Tigray forces. And because they say we serve anybody who is in, who is in need. And uh, um, What is what is 20, 50, 100 cars traveling to different places? Yeah, it, it is something, but as compared to the system that was existing before, it is far from that. Now, what they do also, MSF, is to pro, to, re, to restock, because every hospital, every health post has been has been looted. They restock it, but sometimes the Eritreans come back. The Eritreans, the Eritrean army comes back, they loot it. Uh, they loot it again. Um, so it, it is possible to, to access these places, provided you can get behind these behind these road uh, behind these roadblocks. Two of the forgotten or maybe less reported populations in Tigray today are the minority ethnic communities uh, who live near the border area between. Uh, Tigray and Eritrea. I'm specifically mentioning the Irob uh, mm -hmm. community and also the Ethiopian Kunamas, as well as Eritrean refugees who were stuck yeah. at the Hitsats and the Shemelba mm -hmm. refugee camps uh, between November and December 2020. Have you been able to reach out to either of these communities through your contacts? Uh, yes. Yes, because we are in contact with people who used to work with these refugee camps before the war started and they maintained their contact. Uh, Kunamas have, there are the Ethiopian Kunamas or the Tigrayan Kunamas, but they have been increasing very strongly because many Kunamas from Eritrea moved across the border in the last, in the last 20 years. These are people who are targeted, especially by the Eritrean by the Eritrean regime. Many of the people, if we have statistics, we have not so many statistics of names of people who died in these refugee camps, but the names that we get, they are often Kunama names, as people massacred in these uh, refugee camps. In Europe, it is, you know, they, these are totally different types of area, uh, types of areas. Uh, the place where the Kunama live, that is around Badme, that's uh, wide plains with, with uh, with bushland, very sparse population. The, the Arab, they live high in the mountains. Mount Asimba is 3,500 meters high or something. They live on the slopes of that, uh, they live on the slopes of that, uh, of that mountain. They have uh, people in Kunama area are more used in moving. I would not be semi-nomadic. I don't know if that the term is good. People in People in Europe, they need their land on which they are living. They are working since generations on the same on the same farmland. If you move, you have no no food, so they really need to stay on their land in order to try to produce something. 
or they become refugees to the towns. Yeah, that is then the, the other uh, alternative. This, the problem with of the Arab people, it started also before, before this war, because when the official boundary delimitation was done by in, in the Algiers agreement, they cut Europe into two pieces, giving half of the Arab area to Eritrea and the other half of Europe to Tigray, Ethiopia. Uh, and the Arab people, they say, we wanted to stay together and we want to stay in Ethiopia or we want to stay with, with Tigray. And now Eritrea is like including the whole Arab area to, to, to them and there they are all these places, Arab is one of them, but if you go to Gulo Marqueda, they, they are reaching out uh, Eritrean ID cards. If you don't want to sign for it, you don't get any any help, any food aid, nothing, uh, nothing anymore. They killed a lot of people, a lot of priests. So they are very much under under uh, pressure from the from the uh, Eritrean side. So it seems that these minority communities are being displaced. Even during this crisis, Kunama, yes, before. but I don't know for 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 Europe, they are really being repressed and uh, uh, I don't well, they are being displaced. Yes, if you what what happens in such case is that uh, people are going move to gorges and to and to forests and any inaccessible place, and they they make some makeshift place for for living there eh? and old people, the, the, the babies and so on, the best option is to move to the town and to be begging for, yeah, well, because all these so-called IDPs, they are, they are reduced to status, status of beggar, huh? simply waiting until maybe they get something. The Hitsats and Shamalba refugee camps, uh, where most of the Eritrean refugees uh, were uh, located among the four main ones, including Mayaini and Hadi Harush, uh, were raised uh, during this conflict as well. And well, the UN raised, yeah, yeah, raised. And the UN in late March finally were able to reach those destinations and confirm that those camps were ransacked. Do we yeah. know who uh, perpetrated these crimes or the significance to which these um, atrocities were committed? A uh, long according to satellite image imagery it is quite widespread and you could even follow one week one area another week one area so they did effort really uh, they did effort really to go there and to destroy to destroy uh, uh, what could be uh, what could be destroyed i must say honestly that i have not been following not been following it up uh, there is a We, I know people who have been working with the refugee camps, but we have not been working ourselves directly in those in those areas. I don't have my own contact persons on the ground, so I don't want to tell you a story which I which I don't know. If if you need such people another time, I can give you contact huh, for another talk. Sounds good. About, about I love the it. refugee camps. We also know that there's another set of refugees. I'm talking, of course, about the Tigrayan civilian population, which has moved west to Sudan. Do we know, as of yet, the situation for people in the border area between Tigray and Sudan, and whether the Al Fashaga area has been a, re a region of contention between the Sudanese government and the Ethiopian government? These are again the the people who are in the refugee camps in Sudan, they are not in the Al Fashaga area. They are beyond. They are beyond that. Okay. They are farther. They are farther inside Sudan. They are on the northern side, I think, of the the Kese River, which becomes Setit, whereas the Al Fashaga is south of the Setit uh, of the Setit uh, River. Um, relatively. Relatively, we have been thinking the people in Sudan are better off than those who are refugee inside Ethiopia, because at least they are free from that military aggression that is continuously around, and food supply is is better. Now they are facing a very bad weather. But can you imagine what is going to happen in in Chire and in Mekele and all these towns with all these hundreds of thousands of displaced people and the rainstorm? 
yeah, it will be catastrophic also. Huh? Now, Alpha Saga is Alpha Saga is an, is an, is a good situation apart. Um, if you take the official map that is issued by the Ethiopian government, Alpha Saga is not part of is not part of Ethiopia according to to well they claim and Amara region has a very specific uh, view on that. But the maps that are published internationally, they give, have this the Sudanese version of the of the border. Uh, Amara was a large, a larger triangle. There was also a small triangle west of Humera, where Tigrayans were living. Yeah. Um, so um, these lands, Meles was, was 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 diplomat in there, and I think they paid some money to the. They paid some money, but they never formally claimed uh, claimed the area. Then the, the, these last years, the Amara. Uh, government has been very strong for claiming this as to be formally part of Ethiopia and Amhara region, and then uh, it went wrong. Do you think that's an issue, though? Because the lack of an institutionalization of the border has flared more conflict. Because Alpha yeah, Shaga, um, as you know, uh, is yeah. a fertile uh, area. O obvious, if we if we have that war between that stupid war between Ethiopia and Eritrea in 1998, that was already about borders that are different. On, but as long as long as there are no other contention, contentions, it's possible to 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 solve such to solve such things. But if you have already a lot of other things, then this is a nice topic to to start a war over those uh, over such. Um, such uh, borders, huh? but yeah, that's yeah. that's the result of colonial borders. <laughs> How much uh, of a role have colonial borders played in Tigray specifically, or if you know, in any other parts of the country? Uh, well, uh, Ethiopia was using one map, Eritrea was using another map, yeah, and then uh, in many African countries, you have had such. Um, have had such cases, Libya and Chad, and even for much bigger. Uh, for much, but I would not say, you know, this border between Eritrea and Tigray shouldn't be there. I mean, I mean, for a very long time, people were simply crossing that border, simply. Yeah? And uh, there was people in Adigrat when I came in the beginning. You know, that Adigrat was the most modern town when I came in 1994, in the whole of Tigray, with sidewalks and all that, because they had a lot of experience from Asmara. Yeah, and they tried to copy a bit what they saw the Italians built in Asmara, they tried to copy it to, to Adiklat, and people were moving were moving up and down in, <coughs> in both directions across the border. Building commerce <coughs> and infrastructure, that sort of inspired the... That, yes, that inspired, that inspired them. Adiklat was very strong in developing motor pumps and so on, because they took some inspiration. Um, people moved across the border. The families are, they speak the same language. The families are on both sides of the border. And that border is basically a colonial border. Italia, Italy needed to have a stretch along the Red Sea. Yeah, and that's why, and they, they made, they, and they made a, a border as far as they could reach. Yeah, they, they fought battles for that. And then at a certain moment they fixed uh, they fixed the border, and then we have that we have that legacy nowadays. Now, what I fear with this is all the massacres that have happened, all the bad things that have happened, and that's something that many Tigrayans tell me. Oh, I'm so afraid for the future. How could we ever live as neighbors with uh, as neighbors with Eritrea after doing after they did all that? And so the rest is. There is this, and uh, mothers will be telling to their children, and in 100 years, they will still be talking about all these things. But I must say, right. I was born in a village at 20 kilometers from the German border. Germany invaded Belgium twice. Yeah, I was born 12 years after the Second World War. People were going back to Germany for shopping, and uh, yeah, and even though all the bad things, but you're still having people nowadays in Belgium who don't want to go to Germany because of the bad things that Germany has done so long ago. Huh? But I mean, after 10 or 15 years after the war, 
it was it was settled and of course germany did a very strong introspection uh, they made a very strong reversal of their uh, they totally not only abandoned but re-educated their people regarding regarding to nazis and and and, uh, and and so on but on such a condition i think a peace again between Tigray and, and, and Eritrea can be can be possible, but there should of course be admission of guilt and, and all that. And I think going back to what you were saying about the legacy of this conflict, but also the 1998 border war, it's a reopening wounds. And these political leaders are they keep inciting violence because of their own political interest or their own security interest. To me, to me that war. That war about black marketing of coffee and, and such type of reasons. Uh, Eritrea was buying the coffee at by beer and they sold it off in dollars and, and this type of uh, Eritrea was buying the Ethiopian coffee and they sold it off in dollars. So they were plundering the, the economy of Ethiopia. These are things that should not lead to war. Right? If you have if you have such, such a, you do an economic war, you close the border, but there is no need for for attacking and uh, and so on. But yeah, people have been, how should I say, overproud. The problem is also that both sides always believe that they can win. And this will be an easy win. Yeah. And I was also also with, with, uh, with this war. Both sides were also were saying, uh, Adi Ahmed was, was saying, we will walk in there. And even one month after the war, not one civilian was killed, whereas thousands and thousands had been had been killed, but on the same side, from the side of the Tigrayan uh, politicians, they were telling to the people, uh, oh, we are not afraid for Adi. Yeah? Or we are not afraid of, of Isaias. We will send the supporters of Adi Grad Football Club, we will send them to Asmara, and already the, the regime is fallen in Asmara. This type of talk. This is not responsible. You cannot talk to population and telling such, such stories. People, you know, a few months before the war, there was and uh, Ethiopian government was cutting off the uh, Ethiopian government was cutting off the, the financing of the regional government of Tigray. And uh, then I was communicating with my friends in McKillen. Oh, Abi, we are not afraid of Abi. We are afraid of the locusts. Yeah, and they really believed that I, you know, I saw these special forces. These were young boys. They were more busy with their mobile phone than really doing and showing off and so on. This was not really, they were not ready for, for this. So they, so in my view, that was a big mistake in, in telling we are so strong and we are going to win this war very easily, which didn't, which didn't happen then. Now what has happened, of course, you saw it already when the elections were there, despite, I, I give you several of my own criticisms to TPLF, which are also criticisms, criticisms of many parts of the, of the population. When the elections came, the people voted TPLF. Because if somebody has to resist to that invasion, TPLF would be the, the strongest. And now you see again, you see the youth is running to the mountains. They're not running to the mountains to, to start a war to, because they want TPLF back. No, they want to be free in their country. I don't know if they win this war, how it is going to, how it's going to go. And, and sometimes I'm making this reflection in the Second World War, Churchill was leading the British. In 1945, there's a victory. In 1946, there is elections, and Churchill he loses the elections. Yeah? And it should be it should be possible. It's not because one party wins a war that 20 years later they should still be in power. Yeah? There should be democracy, yeah? even immediately after the after the war. And I have uh, so I have mixed mixed feelings about uh, about that. And it is the <laughs> it are all these poor people who are now suffering so much of that. I must say, I must say, I'm surprised when I see this Getacho and a few others who are really, sorry to say, bureaucrats, always hiding in hotels and, and so on. I would never have believed them to be able to go to the mountains and to do a guerrilla war. I was, would have think they have so, have been so used to their, so I was very surprised, but except, except those who are old, yeah, and who couldn't move anymore or had some other reason. But they managed, they managed to, 
to go to the to the mountains. I was I was surprised that they were able to to do that. And then those who left behind, they have out. Many have been imprisoned or they have been killed. Huh? That, that's another case when we speak about uh, murders. Um, Seyum and, and his friends and so on, old men, blind men, shot plane in, in their in their front. That, that's that's direct murder. Huh? So they have been doing all these uh, bad things. I guess another aspect of the conflict besides civilian casualty that I think could help your research, but is also something that's interested me just more generally about geography is the before and after effects of surveying a region or gathering a subset. What do you plan to do whenever this conflict ends or if you're if there is an ability to do this, yeah. uh, do you uh, want to go in and uh, sample different parts of the region? Uh, if what? I'm also 63 years old, so we'll try to do what, what, is, still, uh, what is still possible. Um, I want to go back in the first place. I, I would have approached at three levels. And one is to go back to the places that I know best, where I did my PhD, and uh, to talk again with the people, to repeat measurements that I did during my PhD, to repeat them, and which we have done a few times later, and to repeat them again to see how the land degradation has, has uh, changed. Then I think this visiting different spots that I know and rephotographing them again, that will also help. And then of course, satellite imagery is going to help a lot. And that is also, that is also why we are much faster now for recognizing famine than, uh, than in the 1980s, because now we have Famine early warning. We have satellite imagery, and we can immediately see what is uh, what is going on. So even uh, on a yearly basis in the same season, we should monitor. We should monitor the changes that are happening in, in the right. Should the conflict continue in a closed-off manner, how do you plan to continue covering the region with respect to the safety of civilian population, and for your team as well? Yeah, uh, we are we are doing basically much of this is, is done in after hours, after work hours, by voluntary work and so on. We are trying to get some funding for for this to count these casualties, uh, and that's something that we want to uh, that we want to uh, to continue, but. If this continues again a second, a second uh, more than more than a year, we may have to to, re to rethink it because we are publishing an update every month, and that would become then you would really need to hire staff and so on huh, to continue the same thing for years and for years. Huh? So I'm not yet thinking that far. We hope still, I hope still that with all the international pressure. And I think a little bit more sanctions would would help uh, would help also. But with all this international pressure at a certain moment, they need to sit and talk. And uh, let's hope that it will work out like that. What short or long term impacts uh, has this conflict had on the physical geography of Tigray and the conditions in which people uh, live? It depends how long it will. It will. It will depend how long it will. How long it will last. Huh? Uh, the land. My understanding is that the land is quite resilient. That means that even if trees are cut, if you take off your hands from it and you wait a couple of years, it will grow. Yeah? The people are resilient. Yeah? But that is the, the strong thing. The strong thing with the agricultural system in, in Tigray is that it is very adapted to all these mountain conditions. And the people still have that knowledge. And so they are going to be able to rebuild it quite rapidly. I think that is my, my understanding of the, uh, of the situation. Now, if this is going to last in the same way for 10 years, yeah, but then there would be 
it would be a big crime from from the whole international community eh, if, if, if they allow this to go for for more than one year eh? so uh, let's hope that let's hope that they, that they settle it soon eh? dr neeson i'd like to give you the final word on the topics discussed oh yeah that is that is so well my my final word is then to greet all my friends in Tigray, be it in McKinley University, be it in uh, be it in Bogatembian, be it everywhere in Tigray where I have my friends. I can only say them one word in Tigrinya, and that is Ajokum. Dr. Neeson, I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. It's my pleasure. Thank you.